Your heart is one of the most important organs in your body, but are you doing everything you need to do to keep it healthy? Today we're learning all about how you at home can keep that heart of yours beating for a little bit longer, here on The Younger You. I'm on top of the world, now I'm living, and the good just gets better, keeps on giving, not even close to the end, it's just beginning, life is getting lighter while the days are getting brighter, yeah, and if the good, I won't even worry anymore, took all my cares, still can kick them all out the door, go on a try, come and tell me what you're waiting for, move and keep them going till your life is overflowing, yeah. Welcome to The Younger You, today on the show, it's all about heart health. Approximately 600,000 people die of heart disease in the United States every year. Heart health is something we all need to take more seriously. Let's go meet up with a great friend of mine, Dr. Joshua Redd, to learn all about the differences between a healthy and unhealthy heart. Thanks, Troy. I'm here at the Intermountain Medical Center Heart Institute. Our hearts are amazing organs that pump our blood, which is how oxygen and vital nutrients travel throughout our bodies. It's important we do all we can to keep our hearts healthy. Today I'll be talking to Dr. Kent Meredith about heart health, and together we'll show you the differences between a healthy heart and an unhealthy heart. Let's go get started. Welcome Dr. Meredith. Thanks for having us here. We're excited to see the heart, and it sounds like we have some different tools here as well, is that right? We do. We've got a lot of really interesting uh, objects and devices that we use to treat heart disease. Um, I'll start by just showing you the heart. The heart is just a fancy muscle. It's designed to pump fluid or blood and uh, circulate it through the body. So you have four chambers, um, the top ones and two bottom ones. The bottom ones are thick muscular chambers and then you have four valves, two here. These the valves are all white in this model and then two valves that come out of the heart and these valves allow the blood to go in one direction so that every time the heart, which is again it's just a muscle, yeah. it contracts so it forces the blood to go one direction and these valves make sure that that happens. Which one of the valves is most important or works the hardest? All four of the valves can be involved with diseases, but the ones that cause really serious heart disease yeah. are the mitral valve, which is this one here, and the aortic valve. And, and those valves are involved with pumping the blood from the left side of the heart, which is really where uh, the circulation to the body occurs. Yeah. So what would occur if this valve was not functioning properly? The patient would probably experience shortness of breath, feeling tired, swelling in the legs, and, and generally they would just feel run down. The shortness of breath, would it be, be because the blood is pumping or getting blocked back into the lungs or what would be causing that? Often yes, because the mitral valve, this valve that we're talking about, upstream from that valve is the, are the lungs. And so if the blood goes backward, it pools in the lungs. The pressure goes up in the lungs and the patient develops what we call congestion or congestive heart failure. Yeah. They can't breathe. If they lie down at night, they'll feel like they're suffocating or they're drowning. They'll have to sit up. And of course, that does help a little bit because gravity pulls that, that fluid a little bit down into their lower parts of their body. So yeah. relieve some of those symptoms. My little nephew, cutest little kid, he just passed away, two months old, and I think because of, of this valve problem, because the ventricle kind of thickened up and it caused blood to back up in his, in his lungs. And so. Unfortunately, it, it can occur in, in children, and that's usually a, what we call a congenital uh, heart defect or, yeah. or birth defect. Yeah. Um, more commonly, it occurs in, in elderly patients over time as these valves wear out. Yeah. Yeah. There are some actually pretty neat devices that have been developed to help treat those diseases. Many of these devices can actually be implanted through a catheter, which means that it doesn't require open heart surgery. Really? So to start, this, is a, this would be kind of an example of a catheter. It's just a really a, a slender tube. It's small enough that it can be implanted into a vein or an artery. And wow. we can either go through the, the leg or through the wrist, sometimes through the neck. These devices can all be deployed initially through this tube. A catheter, right? Through a catheter. Yeah. And you think about all the elderly patients that are struggling that couldn't have open heart surgery that are now saved by these devices. Right. One of the most common diseases of the elderly affects this aortic valve. That's this valve that we have in red here. All of the blood that leaves the left ventricle and goes to the body has to go through that aortic valve. And this disease is called aortic stenosis. I'll just show you first a normal aortic valve. 
the three leaflets that open and close and allow the blood to, to circulate through this valve, you can see that my finger easily goes through there. So these are wow. normal leaflets. This is what happens in people as they get older and those leaflets wear out. They get covered with scar tissue and calcium and I can't get my finger through there anymore. These are very hard, brittle leaflets and so this valve is essentially stuck closed. This is an example of a new kind of valve technology that can actually be collapsed and deployed through a catheter. Wow, no So kidding. that you can essentially place the catheter through there, remove the catheter, and then there's a balloon inside of that valve that can be expanded and place the valve where it needs to be without ever wow. opening the heart. After the break, we'll continue to hear from Dr. Red on how you can keep your heart healthy at home. Looking for the perfect beauty product? Each week, The Younger You highlights a standout product in the health and beauty industry. Head over to theyoungeryou.tv and check it out. Love to hear your comments. Did you know that the heart beats over 2.5 million times in an average human life? I can't believe it myself. Let's hear more from Dr. Red all about this fascinating organ. What are some of the most common diseases that affect the arteries or, or veins of the heart? The most important disease that we see in the United States, and in fact in most of the developed world, is coronary artery disease. And that is a plaque that gets deposited in these little arteries that, that cover the surface of the heart. Yeah. These are the arteries that feed the heart muscle. And so when they fill up with plaque, the blood can't get through there, and the muscle downstream from that blockage dies. Fails. That's a heart attack. Okay. In the past, the best way to open up those blockages would have been to go to the operating room and have a bypass surgery. And that's where they take either veins or arteries from different parts of your body, and they sew that segment of vein or artery around the blockage so that the blood will flow past the blockage okay. through that, yeah. that bypass. Mm -hmm. Well, nowadays, we do a lot of that treatment through a different technique. We do it through, again, through catheters. Wow. So what I have here is an example of a coronary stent. It's essentially a, a tiny metal tube. It's mesh. You can see it's flexible. And in fact, when it's delivered, it's actually pinched or crimped down on a tiny balloon. And so you can deliver these catheters wow. through the artery, and it'll come up into the heart, or you can advance these balloons with the stent already on it, when it gets into the position of the blockage, you inflate a balloon, open it or expand the stent, and then it, and it stays it, open. It holds that blockage open. And that's a great therapy for most blockages. And yeah. In fact, if you're having a heart attack, that's the quickest and best way to open that artery. Wow. And, it, and it's been shown to save lives. That's great. What can the viewers do to minimize the placking in the heart? The number one thing that causes this disease in Americans is probably high blood pressure. But we've got a lot of other things that are very common. Diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking. Um, those are, those are yeah. really critical risk factors. And those are things that you can do something about, especially yeah. smoking. Yeah. Uh, smoking is probably the worst thing you can do if you have risk factors for heart disease. Yeah. When you talk about diabetes and blood sugar and, and things like that, there's new research coming out that high cholesterol and cardiovascular problems is not just from eating fatty foods, but from actually just eating sugar. Foods that, that raise your sugar quickly and then cause the insulin to spike insulin surgery. are probably very important in the development of heart disease. Yeah. So foods that are better would be foods that slowly release that, that glucose or the carbohydrate into your bloodstream. Yeah. And th those are the more complex carbohydrates, more natural fruits and vegetables, as opposed to, uh, say, Capri Suns <laughs> or Starburst yeah. or Snickers. Yeah. yeah. Show us what, what this does. So I have one more device. This is an IVC filter. This goes in the inferior vena cava, so IVC. And this is really designed, again, uh, to be delivered through a catheter so it collapses down mm -hmm. and then when it's positioned it will capture any clot that might be coming up from the legs yeah. that would go to the heart. One of the most dangerous conditions that we see is called a pulmonary embolus which is where a blood clot can form in the legs and the veins. If that clot begins to, to travel the blood will carry it up 
to the heart where it could go out into the lungs. Wow. And in, in many cases that could lead to sudden death. What are symptoms that patients will have if they are suffering with something like that? The most common symptom for a pulmonary embolism would be shortness of breath and chest pain. Often it happens after pain or swelling in the leg and classically it might happen after you've been sitting for a long period of time. Let's say you were uh, sitting for eight or ten hours on the airplane. You get off, you notice that you've got a pain in your calf yeah. and your leg is swollen. You uh, walk down to the baggage claim and then a few minutes later you suddenly start to feel yeah. short of breath and your chest hurts. You don't want to worry about bags, you want to go straight to the hospital. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right? That's wow. right. I think one of the best ways to make your heart better <laughs> is to exercise regularly. If you want to w drive your car for a mile, like walk there instead. I'm into power walking. I try to walk at least 10,000 steps every single day. One of the hardest things about staying healthy is food because we have a lot of bad food here in America, and by that I just mean unhealthy. It's hard to make myself eat the foods that I want to, take the time to prepare them. For me, exercise is easy, but um, it's the cookies, you know? Who wants to eat boiled chicken when you can have a piece of cake or a burger? Burgers are delicious, so it's hard. Your left arm starts hurting right before a heart attack. You get a chest pain. Disorientation, I believe. Rapid breathing. Fatigue, so extreme fatigue for women. I was really confused because I thought I was having heart attack a lot before, but I just had heartburn, so I actually have no idea. Coming up after the break, I put our super fit Dr. Red under a physical stress test. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for updates on the show and join the Younger You conversation. Be sure to check out the Younger You website to watch full episodes of the show. Stay up to date on the Younger You Challenge and get useful tips and tricks to help you achieve the Younger You. Together we've learned all about the heart. Are you ready for your own test? I hope you've been taking notes because now I'm going to show you how Dr. Red did on his. All right, welcome back. We're here at the Intermountain Medical Center Heart Institute with Dr. Anderson. We're going to do a stress test and see how weak I am. <laughs> well, why do we do a stress test? Well, you know, there's several reasons we do stress tests. First of all, if somebody's having chest pain or they're short of breath or they're more fatigued, we want to know if there are narrowings or blockages in their arteries. And everything might look perfectly fine at rest, but when we put them uh, into a little stress, a little exercise, more demand on the heart to supply those exercising muscles, then we can see changes on the cardiogram that indicates ischemia, we call yeah. it, or a reduced yeah. blood supply. Now another reason is just, even if we don't suspect that, what is your functional capacity? Uh, what kind of shape are you in? What is your blood pressure response? What's your heart rate response? Is it normal or abnormal? So there are a number of reasons we do it, and this is one of the most, I think, efficient uh, and important tests that we have in cardiology. That's great. I haven't worked out for two weeks, so they might find something on me, so it'll be good. Human sandpaper. Yes. That hurts a little bit. Okay, so we're taking my blood pressure sitting and then standing, and then we'll take it throughout the stress test every two minutes or so. See how healthy this heart is. Okay, yep, coming through loud and clear, 130 over 84. Perfect. And we follow your heart rate, um, and it's up to about 100, and it'll go up probably a little bit each time. We expect at your age you ought to be able to get up to as high as 190, but generally if we get over 170, we'll figure that's a pretty good stretch. Yeah. So we're coming up on two minutes, so what I'm going to have you do is to just give me this arm and pull it in, just sort of balance with that arm, and we'll catch your blood pressure there. 152. Okay. Over 80. Good, okay. So you just had one little extra beat there, an atrial ectopic beat, so we watch for that, and that's pretty normal. Is that pretty normal? From the top of the heart, I'm sure we usually see. Atrial see that. ectopic beat. Yep. I'm not dying so far. You're not dying so good. far. You're good, you're feeling good. okay. So now we've sped things up a little bit. Uh, the angle has gone up a little bit. So this is a moderate uh, amount of stress. 
Okay, you're ready to go to stage yep. three here? Ready. All right. It's kind of like a now we get into mild the... jog here. Yeah. Uphill though is a little bit different. Yeah. It works different areas. My calves are. I might not get past this stage. No, I might get past this stage. Well, don't overdo, you know. We don't want to have to bring the defibrillator in. Here. <laughs> And uh, we get through. The, we get through the fastest. Do you want to uh, call it uh, good after this? Oh no! Oh no! Keep going. I keep going. Huh? My pride. Yeah, that incline. Okay, that's still 170 over 74. Okay. So we're holding steady on the blood pressure. You want to try a little bit of stage four? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, you betcha. Okay, three more minutes, so you can do it. But this is the tough one. Not many finish stage four. We're at ten minutes now. One out of the three minutes already done on four. Nice. Heart rate one seventy three, so we're above the ninetieth percentile, which we, we would consider uh, certainly an adequate maximal stress test for you. In other words, I don't see any abnormal changes no. on the EKG, That's and uh, this is all reassuring. Blood pressure while running. It's got <laughs> sweet skills. 178 over uh, 72. <laughs> okay, we're, we're done. We'll slow down quickly. Slow down here. And uh, didn't let you stop. It's my favorite part. <laughs> Great job. Okay, now we're coming down. We're 150 over 78. Nice. Typically, when you have patients do this test, what do you find, and, and what's the reason for having them do the test? To find out where their functional capacity is, how long can they go, and that's a tremendous predictor. Uh, and the better shape you're in, um, especially as you age, you know, the better your prognosis. Yeah. And so how long can you go? The more you can do, you know, the yeah. better the lifestyle is. Yeah. Gotcha. Great. You've just watched me perform an exercise stress test. However, a more common type of stress test is called a PET scan stress test. PET stands for Positron Emission Tomography. This scan is an imaging test that uses a radioactive substance to look for a disease or poor blood flow in the heart. This test is used to diagnose heart problems and show areas of poor blood flow to the heart. Many facilities prefer this type of stress test as it gives a more accurate result. I feel exhausted just watching it. Let's take a quick break and then we're going to bring Dr. Red back into the studio and talk about what you can do to maintain a healthy heart. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for updates on the show and join the Younger You conversation. Do you know what exercises you need to do to keep your heart healthy? Dr. Red is actually going to tell us a little bit more about the heart and how we can keep it pumping. I have a list of do's and don'ts, Dr. Red, of these issues that we've been talking about. One of them is smoking. Why is it important to your heart health not to smoke? Here's the problem is because it will increase carbon monoxide throughout our blood and that decreases oxygen and our body needs oxygen and so our heart has to pump harder which will cause increased blood pressure, right? It also has to pump faster. And so this will end up causing atherosclerosis throughout the, throughout the arteries, you know, which is placking, mm -hmm. end up causing uh, definite problems for our heart health. But the good news is as soon as we stop smoking, our risk of having a heart attack or heart disease uh, decreases to almost as, as far as a non-smoker in five years. Okay, 30 minutes of exercise. Some people are flat out doing 10. Yeah, I mean, if we can do th at least 30 minutes of exercise on a consistent basis every day, that's huge. And the reason why is because exercise increases nitric oxide throughout the cardiovascular system. This will actually help decrease plaque and also increases plasticity uh, in the arteries and veins, which is great. Nitric oxide, what's that? Nitric oxide is a, is a different gas that our body produces during exercise. Okay. And there's two forms of nitric oxide called ENOS and NNOS that are really, really good for heart health. And so if we can exercise consistently, that's a, that's a great thing for heart health. What are some great healthy foods for the heart? One of the biggest problems that we're finding now is actually diets high in glucose. 
And so even simple sugars, we're eating lots of sugars. Even something as simple as having lots of fruit in the morning, you know, having, having like a fruit shake or whatnot. Yeah. If we eat a meal full of glucose, that will increase what's called an insulin surge. Okay. That's where a pancreas you know, puts forth insulin to try to lower the blood sugar levels. But that insulin surge is terrible for the cardiovascular system. What are a couple of foods that you shouldn't be eating? Most of Americans' diet is composed of simple sugars and simple carbohydrates, and very few of us are eating, eating a diet composed of vegetables and So and lean when, when I hear you say that, Dr. Red, and I've spoken to many doctors, it's like caveman food. It's going back to what is grown. It's, yeah, exactly. It's going back to protein, vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, beans, peas. Those are a lot healthier for us. Mm. I mean, you think about all the things that occur in our diet right now, the quality is drastically, uh, you know, declining because we're trying to get this increase of quantity, right? And that's causing tons of problems with, with, our, with our diet. Examples of saturated fats and trans fats. So our, our I always get them confused. Yeah, our red meats, uh, our dairies, those are, are definitely examples. Fried foods are trans fats. Uh, we definitely want to stay away from fried foods and fried fast foods even worse. Fair food? Fair food. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in all reality, you're looking at <laughs> cardiovascular disease is increasing tenfold over the last 20 years. Yep. And so, you know, there's certain things that even if we cut down even a little bit, it's going to be a lot better for our health. Healthy fats. Healthy fats will be like avocados, nuts, doing those types of things. But also an important subject would be to make sure that we're eating a higher source of, of seafood like salmon and, oh, really? and good quality of fish will actually really help the heart health as well. What else should we be looking out for that we shouldn't be doing? We're now living this life of high stress and that causes increased cortisol levels. Just simply trying to do things that will allow stress to, to you know, be minimal is crucial as well. Okay, one of the things I saw interesting on my list was avoid the pollution. That's, I'm sorry, that's everywhere. You know, we see in China, people and the traffic cops with those masks yeah, with the on mask their face. Yeah. You're not saying to go around and do that. No, you know? no, but finding ways in your life to get away from that, whether it's having better filters in your home, living away from big cities, things like that uh, mm. is proven to, to really help that. You were saying stress a little bit earlier on causes heart disease. How is it doing that? Just because it's beating faster or well, tension? Uh, or? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. One, it actually causes like a fight or flight, you know, a fight or flight response, which increases cortisol. And cortisol over a prolonged period of time is actually hazardous to the heart. So look, I know if you do yoga and I know if you do breathing exercises, that can decrease stress. Is there anything that you would think about like naturopathic medicine or, you know, natural herbs that you could be taking yeah. to help you cope with the stress? Yeah, there's some uh, adaptogens called ashwagandha, which is, has been proven to be really beneficial to help with stress so mm. your body can handle stress better. Yeah. Um, there's obviously chiropractic care, massage therapy. Yeah. Uh, those types of things are, are really beneficial. Okay, too. we're going to put up all that information of natural remedies as well on our website. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming in. We Thanks really for having appreciate me. it. Heart disease is the leading cause of death for both men and women. That's why it's so important that we do everything we can to maintain a healthy heart. I hope you learned some changes you can make that will keep your heart beating much longer. For more information that you heard about the show tonight, head over to our website at theyoungeryou.tv and I'll see you next week. Next week on The Younger You, we've reached the end of our 12-week Younger You Challenge. Tune in to see how our contestants actually did. The Younger You set provided by Madison McCord Interiors. <laughs>